Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, Emily Sophia, here to break down for you guys the season three premiere of Bates Motel Death in the Family. So, spoiler alert, because I will be bearing all in this review. And it is so ridiculously good to be back with one of my favorite psychological serial killer dramas. Um, Bates Motel, man near and dear to my heart, or as I like to call it, family with benefits. So, quick little announcement before we dive into the video. My Better Call Saul review is going to be up tomorrow, or probably once you're watching this video later today. It's tough to review more than one show in a single night when you're working full-time, which is lame and gross, but I definitely had to prioritize Bates Motel tonight because it's it's back at long last. So there's that. And then also link in the description to a new channel of which I am part. It is called the Waffle Press. I am the official weekly co-host along with my, um, my friend and the primary content creator, main host, Diego. We talk about lots of things. We do podcasts and you guys would do well to go give us a listen. It'll be a good time. Anyway, so we have much, much to discuss. <laughs> so many things. What a riveting, emotional, nail-biting, under-your-skin freaking premiere we were just served. As you guys may recall, last season, season two, kicked off on quite, a, quite an upbeat note because we saw that the bypass had been delayed and that... Norma and Norman were enjoying actually having guests at their at their hotel, living life together all in delightful familial bliss, as it were. And this season, of course, we left off last time around with Norman finally fusing his his psychological unrest with the face of his mother. Norma Bates to create the persona that he will ultimately someday assume as his murderous self, that being mother. So you know that was that was kind of a, a delightful note, a uh, great way to culminate things from last season. And then we come into it this season wondering what exactly we are going to see transpire with Norman and just how much closer he is to becoming who he will someday be. And he is very much a young man divided at this point, divided amongst the ladies in his life. And there are so many ways to break down what we witnessed and all of the interactions and dynamics and what was most, most disturbing to me in, in this week's episode was the way that Norman is kind of becoming cognizant of how he can use and manipulate people because earlier on in the story we see him a lot as as a victim of a truly horrific past and then of course there's that lingering question of where exactly did that spark of darkness begin and you know, it's it's really hard to pull everything apart but ultimately he has he's experienced quite a few traumas in his life that um, are slowly shaping him into the the man, the monster he shall someday be. But in the meantime, <laughs> so we had, we had three different ladies of interest in this episode. Of course, we know who is at the top of the, well, I guess, I guess it's kind of more of a love triangle at this point. It started off with the whole Annika chick coming in, getting a room, and and he's very drawn to her immediately, and Norma is instantly put off by this woman's presence, and of course we need to talk about the opening scene. <laughs> you know, sweet morning with mother, and uh, Dylan so rudely has to bring attention to the fact that there might possibly be something that is slightly less than ideal about the two of them sharing a mattress and whatnot. But at the same time, who can who can blame Mr. Bates? He's got a smoking hot mama, and uh, that could pose a lot of logistical and bodily issues <laughs> for them to be sharing that intimate space. But 
you know, according according to Norma, when she is confronted by Dylan the the morning after sweet conversations in in the night, she says, you know, they were they were just chatting and lost track of the time, and you know, his his room is so far down the hall, there's just just no way. And what's interesting about about that exchange between the two of them is that Dylan takes a very laissez-faire approach. I mean, we have seen him come down with fire and brimstone and and looks of scorn and agonizing pain. I mean, the guy certainly got got quite a few weapons in his arsenal as as far as reacting poorly to um, the complex Norma Norman relationship. But this time around, he kind of just ever so lightly is like, you know, I, I happen to uh, to see the, the two of you in a place in a certain time, and uh, you know, it's just curious about about your thoughts on the matter like that's kind of the way that he seemed to to bring it up and of course we we know probably what's boiling just beneath his skin about the topic but he decides to take a different approach because with Norma everything is zero to 190 miles an hour and thus you must tread lightly there is not a poker face to be found in this this woman's incredible uh <laughs> palette of colorful expressions so and she she does later actually end up hurting both herself and Norman by telling him that he should probably you know go to his room it's being punished but anyways so lots of things happen this Annika chick shows up and we all get the sense that he he is glued in he is magnetized by this woman's beguiling breastuses and and what have you. So she she is classically and ridiculously attractive, especially to an 18-year-old boy such as himself and one who is um, holds a certain penchant for sexual fantasies and otherwise. <laughs> um, so there's that. We got, we got that all established. Oh, and also it's his first day of school, first day of the last year of his, of his high school career. And it doesn't exactly go swimmingly, shall we say. He seemed to emulate more the classic, like, kindergartner on his first day of school. <laughs> and the way that Norma treats him in that process certainly doesn't help his case that he is now the uppity uppityist of the upperclassmen. Uh, <laughs> certainly by no means. And we got the pleasure of seeing Norma forcefully thrust him out onto the pavement and then, you know, not without tromping all the way around the car in her heels and straightening, straightening his collar and then telling him that she'd see him later. You know, no big deal. <laughs> this is just standard, standard Bates family procedure. And so that happens, and Norman decides to attempt to grin and bear it. He shoots off a text to Emma, where are you, a thousand question marks. And it isn't long before he begins to hallucinate, and Miss Watson appears to tell him T.S. Eliot poems and bleed out the neck, and you know, so, so things go. Classic high school drama, you know. Um, but, so clearly that, that breaks the final straw, of which there was really only one to begin with for this poor lad, and he comes running back to Mama, very much as he did at the end of the first season, when he ran away from arguably killing Miss Watson in the first place. So, that's a thing. Definitely getting those parallels. It's almost like having to, to see that that image of her dying all over again before him. It's as if he has killed her all over again. And that's not exactly, we don't really get to to see exactly how Norman processes that, but, but at any rate, he's right back home and Norma's just kind of dazed and like, oh, you're here, okay. Okay, we can we can make this work and she decides to give him a promotion and a way out of your traditional education and she's kind of the mom of the year and also other things of the year <laughs> but 
That's another matter. Or is it? Everything is so delightfully, disturbingly conflated in this crazy world. So, lots of, lots of pieces are in motion. And then in the midst of all of this, so he, so Norman does get to see Emma after she blew him off at school. And honestly, this was a really great episode for the two of them, even though I don't think that his motives for um, getting together with her are exactly pure, <laughs> but it is still, it's still nice to get to see the two of them strike up this, this sense of accord that they really didn't have last season with the fallout with Bradley and Miss Watson and her boyfriend and his yada yada yada. There was so much interference between the two of them. It was really a small tragedy in and of itself to see the two of them so, so separated. And and a lot of the last season too was um, with Emma, was her putting her heart out on the line and wanting to be a part of the Bates family, the family with benefits, you know? <laughs> Sign up for the benefits package, if you will. But, so, the two, the two of them end up getting together in a, a brief and shining epiphany for, for Norman, where the two of them are talking about doing homeschool together, and then, hey, how about we date? Oh, and also on top of that, of course, she tells him that her lung capacity is decreased, which means that she really doesn't have all that much longer to live, probably a few years left, so that's got to come across as disconcerting to her of course when Norman's like oh well we should we should date let's get together and make this happen for you but it's such as sweet as it seems and as elated as we are for Emma putting ourselves in her shoes her not knowing that this family's got its issues but in the moment it doesn't matter She's been head over heels for Norman since the beginning and has been running around in circles trying to avoid that fact while still being this integral part of their family structure. And now finally, finally, everything comes to a rather sudden and strangely nonchalant fruition, but you know, no less nonchalant than the way that Norma reveals the fact that her mother has died, the mother whom she never really knew. Um, so, so we see that there is this blatant attraction to Annika. There is this new fledgling relationship with Emma that they, they have yet to, to work out all, all the kinks of. But really, there's a lot of different ways to look at what's, what's going on with Emma because we, we know that before he proposed that they go out, he got kicked out of his mama's bed, you know. Can't sleep with with a sexy mama no more. So he's a man on the rebound, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so probably part of it will be to um, incite a little bit of jealousy in, uh, in the heart of Norma and to kind of get back at her for pushing him away. Um, and then there's also, there, there's just so many pieces to it. And I think, I think that a lot of it has to do with putting up a front. And again, it really seems to me that Norman is coming into his own as far as a, there's an increasing level of, of self-awareness, even in the midst of these panic attacks and the psychosis, the blackouts, the things that he experiences, he knows deep down. There is a place where all these different facets of his being converge. And he sees the roles that he needs to assume on the outside while at the same time being pushed and pulled around on the inside by his own desires and the uh, mother persona that arises within him to combat those desires, to punish him for having them by forcing him to kill. Um, so that's the thing. I'm trying to figure out, is Emma like the safest person right now because Norman's not really sexually attracted to her or is she in complete and absolute utter danger? Not only because of her sickness, but just being enmeshed in in the family business in, in all the ways. <laughs> Romantic and professional, you know, business and pleasure alike. So there's lots of moving pieces there. 
And Norma, of course, doesn't even know about this yet, but she she does get to see Norma taking a little look-see at Miss Annika in the shower. I mean, not a lot of subtlety in there. <laughs> that was really just a great big giant Easter egg for for us psycho fans and um you know it begins innocently enough of course he is the newly dubbed manager and and he um is keeping the grounds she's way raccoon and whoopsie daisy would you look at that the window is cracked and he can see the cracks and so that happens and that's a thing and it's something that we could just as easily chalk up to human, male, nature, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But we, we know how deeply all of this runs, of course, from what we know about his relationship with Miss Watson. And we, we see that there is not a lot of innocence to this deep down, maybe on the surface level where Norman is still, still at war and still negotiating his relationship to everything outside of him and his his mother and, and all of that jazz, but we know, we know. And the writers know that we know. And in fact, I read some interviews before um, getting to to see this premiere. Gotta check my time here. Okay, I'm still good. <laughs> but, and they're, they're being incredibly open about about the fact that they are now taking things to the next level and they are bringing us to the future Norman Bates of Psycho and this is precisely what they want to do in no uncertain terms do they clarify that although I'm wondering I'm wondering just how they're going to play with us along the way of course they put on a fabulous performance not only in terms of the writing but in terms of the power team that is delivering us the the tragedy of the Bateses, but it's good. And I'm gonna be coming right on back for more. Night after night, hopping in Miss Norma's bed, watching watching Netflix, whatever, you know. Just just family stuff. <laughs> but and I, I will mention really quick, uh, before before I completely forget to discuss this, the fact that so Dylan is still on the periphery and now not only is he on the periphery of of his own family the people that he would claim as family those being Norman Norman but he's being pursued by the other man on the periphery in the family that being Caleb his uncle slash father and of course that is an incredibly troubling situation and in no way does Caleb belong in <laughs> this already disturbing structure he doesn't want his presence to to be known by Norma or Norman, but he does attempt to bestow an inheritance on Dylan by stalking him into the woods, which uh, not exactly gonna play out so well, and it doesn't. And Dylan is consistently playing hardball with the guy. He is pretty much un unflinching. No matter how much Caleb pleads for him to be understood and let me be your father and this and that and this and that and every time that he's about to skip town, he just comes circling right on back like a freaking pedo boomerang that nobody wants to play with. So that's the thing. But yeah, so the episode ends up with him going up to... Dylan's cabin and making nice with his assistant and he's it seems unfortunately that Dylan is kind of stuck <laughs> with the guy right now and I'm not sure how all that is going to transpire and honestly I want so much to be interested in what's happening with Dylan and things kind of got squandered with him a little bit last season. I've never been all that compelled by the drug weed war and it seems kind of silly now too since marijuana has been legalized here in the northwest so it's kind of like what's the big deal? I mean there's still a lot of politics to work out with it. It's all really current stuff so it's almost this sort of like alternate universe <laughs> of sorts um, and I'm sure that there's still private 
growing and distribution wars and all that jazz. But anyways, that's never been the most compelling part about this show. Really, it's just more of a way to kind of color the environment in which Norma and Norman are set and to kind of show how the place in which they live, White Pine Bay, reflects the psychosis of this family. That's really the way that I see this and I will accept, I will accept that storyline because of that. We also get to see Romero a little bit too, and he's pretty much refusing to represent all the the weed growers in the area. They're not taking that so well, but he firmly establishes himself in the order of things, and he does what he wants to do. So, I did, I am a little sad that we didn't get to have a nice uh, Norma Romero off. The two of them have such lovely eyes. It's fun when they make eyes at each other because they're just such weird and intense people in their own rights and very fun to put the two of them in one room but not a lot of space for that uh, with with her situation with Norman um, and then so such such an incredible performance from Vera Farmiga this week I am completely and utterly in awe of that woman's acting chops because she brings it time and time and time again so we see of course her total avoidance of the situation of her mother's death at first to the point that she is willing to just kind of toss it out like little just just a little factoid you know fun fact my mom's dead so just just fyi and then as the episode progresses we get to see her confess to Dylan that her, the true hurt that she is experiencing over this loss because it's it's sort of reestablishing a loss that she experienced long ago in getting to have a mother who was physically unable to be there because of her mental state and the medications that she was on and so she was pretty much catatonic there was a mother in there somewhere who might have truly been a mother but was was never able to to be released to be present so there's this one moment that norma has of her that is embodied in the blue flower and the blue dress i know that's gonna come back later she's gonna she's gonna dance with norman in a blue dress that is my prediction as of this moment watch it happen okay i'm just saying i'm just saying um and so later later on Norman comes back and, and finds Norma in complete and utter disarray and she she reveals everything that she, the, the turmoil that is inside of her and uses that as the basis for inviting the sun back into her chambers <laughs> because she's sad. <laughs> that was so beautifully delivered. She just went full like a sea of sad puppies in the face of a one blue-eyed woman. That was pure devastation right there. Just the, but I'm sad to slay down please. And who is Norman to disagree? And he, he uh, you know, rolls up his sleeves, puts on the Ritz and uh, charms his way right into the covers. Undercover lovers, mm-hmm, literally. I like it, I do. <laughs> Oh, all's, all's well, all's well. Um, so, yes, we, we see the, the struggle kind of come full circle now that even though Norma really is trying to do right by Norman, once, once her emotional defenses are down, he's right there for her and he becomes exactly what she needs. So, and okay. What I'm wondering now, based on what transpired at the end of the episode, was Mother backseat driving when Norman took off with Annika? Is she still a thing, or... Well, I'll let you guys do the math and the speculating. Take it all to the comments, and we can chat it up down there. I thank you guys so much for watching this video. It is such a pleasure. Such such a wonderful, fabulous thing to to be back in this business. Anything that I forgot to mention in this vlog, I would most certainly love to discuss with you all below. And just remember, my Better Call Saul review is coming soon, so I will be back week after week. 
Hopefully they will keep some vacancy for us. It's gonna be a good time. So, is mother winning? Is she losing? Where, where exactly is she at? And when are we going to get to see her again? Is the question. I'll let you guys ponder that. Thank you so much again. I love, love, love you all. And as always, I will be back before you know it.